Peace and greetings to you all, and may the grace of God be forever in your favor. In this video, I am going to be addressing the question of whether the Quran does in fact command the cutting of hands for the crime of theft. It is traditionally believed that in verse 38 of chapter 5 of the Quran, God commands or instructs the faithful to amputate the hands of the male and female thief if they have been found guilty. However, this is a position that I have found not to be consistent with the verse in question, and I would like to use this video to present my arguments for why I do not hold this view. But before I get into that, let me first establish my foundation for my research. My understanding of the Qur'an is strictly based on the Qur'an, and I do not rely on any outside sources to determine what the Qur'an means when it makes a statement. Furthermore, many of the core concepts that we may have come to learn might not be consistent with the Qur'anic usage and intent of those terms. And so, when there is a term that I find difficult, I always investigate how the Qur'an uses that term, rather than rely on what that term has come to mean throughout the many centuries after the Prophet. With that being said, I will now proceed with my argument. According to popular translations, the verse in question reads as follows. As for the male thief and the female thief, cut off their hands as a penalty for what they have earned, a deterrent from Allah, for Allah is almighty, all wise. Now, the phrase in question for the purpose of this video is, Faktaru idiahuma, typically rendered as, cut off their hands. And so, it will be this phrase that the majority of this video will be dealing with. It is my belief that the translators of the Quran have indeed erred in their rendition of this phrase. The phrase contains the verb, kata, rendered as cut, amputate, or cut off, as well as the noun, adi, which is typically rendered as hands in this context. However, I would like to dispute not just one of these terms, but both of them. Firstly, when we examine the Quran, we see that the word qata is used 36 times in the Quran, 12 times as both verb forms 1 and 2, and 5 times as verb 5. It is used in other ways, but that is not the concern of this video. What we are most interested in is the verbal usage of the word. In my examination of these verbs, it came to my attention that there is probable cause to suggest that verbs 1 and 2 decline with respect to the magnitude of the noun, meaning that depending on whether the noun is singular or plural, the verb will take on a different form. In the 12 times where verb form 1 is used, in 9 of those times the noun that follows the verb is in its singular, whereas in 2 times it can be argued whether what is meant is singular or plural, as the word used is the indefinite word, what or whatever. And lastly, in 1 of those 12 times there is no noun indicated, however from the context, the likely intended word sababin is also singular. In its 12 usages of verb form 2, katha, in 11 of those times, all the nouns that follow are plural, whereas one is debatable. It is debatable because the plural form of this noun, earth, is not clearly established within the Quran. I would argue that both the singular and the plural share the exact same word for earth, in written form as well as spoken. And as such, this would likewise be consistent with my proposal. However, despite this anomaly, the proposed theory is still credible as there are still 11 instances out of 12, which are more than enough for us to conclude from this that when qatar is used against a direct noun, the noun will automatically be in its plural form, whereas when qata is used against a noun, the noun will automatically be in its singular form. We similarly see that on the page before this verse's page, the word qata is used in verse 33, wherein the end result of those who wage war against Allah and His Messenger, and who cause corruption in the land is outlined, and once again therein, the plural is followed. Yet on the following page, verb form 1 is used in verse 38, despite being followed by a plural. Now, with that having been established, we will now turn our attention to the phrase from earlier. 
Why is it that in the phrase in question, it is what appears to be a plural that follows the word kata? As already showed, the noun in question is aidiyahuma, typically rendered their hands, with hands being in the plural and their being in the dual plural. This is because in Arabic, there are two types of plurals, plural and dual plural. Plural implies more than two, whereas dual plural is two. Due to this ambiguity, it also calls in to question what the actual meaning of this phrase really is if we are to render it as we traditionally have come to learn. Looking at the phrase through this angle, it would seem that the hands that are supposed to be cut must be more than two, since it is the plural form of the word hands that is used and not the dual plural. Had it been a dual plural, the proper rendition would have been yadehima, to indicate both hands from both individuals. However, the current plural, aidiahuma, likewise does accomplish the same task. That being said, however, the practice of this phrase reveals that this is not actually what is done. Instead, this phrase is understood to mean a hand from both of them. But this, in my opinion, is clearly a very poor way of phrasing it if that practice was in fact the intent. The better phrase would have been yadan minhuma or yadan minkuln, meaning cut off a hand from both of them or a hand from each. All these would have been better renditions if the intent was amputate a hand from each of the culprits. Similarly, the verse does not indicate to us what constitutes a hand. In this same chapter, in verse 6, when Allah informs us about the washing ritual when rising up for Salat, He specifies up to which part of the hand we should wash. So, it would seem very bizarre why He would not specify what constitutes a hand when the amputating is taking place. Should it be at the wrist up to the fingers, or from the elbow, or from the shoulder, or from between the elbow and the wrist? This silence on this issue suggests to me that the initial intent of the phrase was never intended to be understood as implying cutting or chopping off the hands. So, why then is the word aidiahuma used after verb form one of the word kata, after we have established that plurals do not follow this verb? Well, my understanding here would be that this word is in fact not a plural, but rather a singular and it does not mean hand. So our task would then be for us to examine the Qur'an and see whether this word has been used in its singular and not to mean hand. To our surprise, it has in fact been used a couple of times, both as a verb and as a noun, but it is the noun that is to our interest. As a noun, this word appears three times, twice in chapter 38, verses 17 and 45, as well as chapter 51, verse 47. But we will focus on chapter 51 for now. Herein, Allah states, As for the heaven, we constructed it with aidin, and we are indeed vastly abounding in means. Here, the word aidin does not refer to hands, and it is not a plural, but rather singular, and it refers to strength, power, might, access, force, support network, and so on. Similarly, in chapter 38, David, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are referred to as men in possession of Aden. Thus, when we transfer this understanding into the verse in question, the meaning of the phrase become even the clearer. The phrase should thence be read as, cut off the Aden of them both, meaning cut off their access, or cut off their support network. Thus, what the Qur'an intends to relay to us in this verse is that when someone is found guilty of the crime of thievery, their community should take the initiative and cut off their support network, which enables them to steal, meaning that the people of the community should put restrictions on them. This also supports the following verse, which states, So whoever turns from his ways after his wrongdoing and reforms, then Allah will indeed be receptive to him, as Allah is indeed forgiving, merciful. Thus, this would mean that when someone is caught stealing, then there should be restrictions placed upon them and placed through a process of rehabilitation 
where they turn from their ways and reform, after which Allah will turn receptively to them, as Allah is forgiving, merciful.